Welcome to another episode of the IFC's Individuation Podcast. Uh, I am Dr. Lahab El Samurai. Here with me is Dr. Eric Tomlinson. Um, and we are going to discuss Young's Map of the Soul. And the way we have decided to do this is that we are going to take chapter one and chapter two today and break them down. And then um, next week, we will go into chapter three um, because chapter three is a long chapter. So we will do chapter three and then we will move henceforth from chapter three. So today is chapter one and two. Now, Dr. Stein is also um, um, writing individual books on each of these chapters. Uh, he has already published uh, Young's Map of the Soul Persona and Young's Map of the Soul um, Ego. So those are going to be coming out and the rest of them will also be coming out. So keep a lookout for his new work. Um, fascinating read. Why are we doing this book? I think part of it is that um, he's quite eloquent in the way he describes Jungian theory and um, understands Jungian theory. He has a depth about him that um, is is profound in our time uh, of somebody talking about ideas in the way he does. So without further ado, we are going to get into it. Eric. Um, yes, sir. Any thoughts on what you read in Dr. Stein's work? Well, one thing that <clears throat> I've always found interesting is how our field of consciousness is larger than the ego itself. Okay. Uh, that it precedes the, even though the ego can be the center of our psyche, it still, it preceded the ego, our field of consciousness did. And I find that fascinating. Um, because in the past, I kind of thought our ego encompassed pretty much our entire field of consciousness. And to find out that it didn't, um, and to be reminded again by reading Murray's book, or Dr. Stein's book, it, it, um, it enlightened me even more. So that was probably one of the big things that hit me from the reading. So I think what you're talking about, I'm going to expand just a little on it to sure. our listeners, is that the ego, um, as Stein describes ego for Jung, is the center of consciousness. Um, as a center of consciousness, it sits in the middle of the field of consciousness, but it doesn't necessarily... Um, it's not the entire field. The entire field is something that already exists. And part of that existence is because um, we have def different ways of um, connecting to uh, the stream of consciousness that does not require ego. Um, the stream is always there. The center is ego. The center is the one that, that puts priority um, on um, what the ego thinks is important and um, how it thinks it's important and why it thinks it should go before anything else. So what the ego does is it prioritizes consciousness and the things that are close to the ego that the ego finds uh, not relevant or feels um, can do without for now. It actually, um, pushes into the unconscious. Um, so when we think of the ego, what we're thinking is of an eye, of an eye, an all seeing eye that sees everything around it. And when we think of the field of consciousness, 
um, we think of waves that are constantly um, running through us. And so, for instance, if we say, wow, did you see that? The ego says, this is not a big deal. You know, you don't need to talk about it so much. The ego relegates it to an inferior position because it does not want you to be conscious of it yet because maybe it's not conscious of it or maybe it needs to be in charge or maybe it's, its awareness of it is disruptive to the ego. So <clears throat> on page 15, as um, in Young's Map of the Soul, Stein states, here Young defines the ego as follows. It forms, as it were, the center of the field of consciousness. And insofar as this compromises the empirical personality, the ego is the subject of all personal acts of consciousness. Consciousness is a field, and what Jung calls the empirical personality here is our personality as we are aware of it. Jung calls the empirical personality here is our personality as we are aware of it and experience it firsthand. The ego as the subject of all personal acts of consciousness, he's quoting Jung occupies the center of this field. The term ego refers to one's experience of oneself as a center of willing, desiring, reflecting, and acting. This definition of the ego as a center of consciousness is consistent throughout all of Jung's writings. So it is the center of consciousness because it is the actor And it is the part of the actor that is engaged in reflecting and acting. And what he says is, and so to understand consciousness, um, Stein says about the unconscious, which is important because then you're, we need to define what the unconscious is to Stein so we understand how he sees and thinks about consciousness. The unconscious is not simply the unknown, it's rather the unknown psychic. That, and this we define as all those things in us, which if they came to consciousness would presumably differ in no respect from the known psychic contents. The distinction between consciousness and unconsciousness is so fundamental in Jungian general theory of the psyche as it is in all of the psychology. Contents are reflected by the ego and held in consciousness where they can be further examined and manipulated while other psychic contents lie outside of consciousness, either temporarily or permanently. And lying outside the field of consciousness doesn't mean that it's 10,000 miles away. It could be um, two inches away. One thing that I like what he said about the unconscious is that the unconscious is comprised not just of the unknown. Because again, in my earlier days, I thought the unconscious was only that what we don't know. And yet it also, it, 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 it's all, it was almost scary to me when I first understood that the unconscious also comprised is comprised of previously conscious content that we have that has gone back into the unconscious. Correct. So it made me think, oh my gosh, the unconscious has got me pegged. It knows exactly how I what I think. Exactly. So the unconscious always has pieces of us that we don't know about. It has also pieces of us that are unknown to us, but that complete us in certain ways that when they come into consciousness, they actually start to make sense in our story, our psychological story. 
but they don't always come into consciousness. That's the trick. Sometimes they stay deep within the unconscious. We are never conscious of it. Um, so he, he goes on to say, the ego like consciousness also transcends and outlasts the particular contents that occupy the room of consciousness at any particular moment. The ego is a focal point within consciousness, its most central and perhaps most permanent feature. Against the opinion of the East, Jung argues that without an ego, consciousness itself becomes questionable. But it is true that certain ego functions can be suspended or seemingly obliterated without destroying consciousness completely. And so a sort of egoless consciousness, a type of consciousness that shows very little evidence of willful center and I is a human possibility, at least for short periods of time. He goes on to say, for Jung, the ego forms the critical center of consciousness and in fact determines to a large extent which contents remain within the realm of consciousness and which ones drop away into the unconscious. The ego is responsible for retaining contents in consciousness and can also eliminate contents from consciousness by ceasing to reflect on them. So we both have the ability, the ego has the dual ability of disavowing certain parts of consciousness and testifying to certain parts of consciousness. That's why the ego in a lot of ways cannot be trusted <laughs> because the ego has an agenda. You're nodding your head, Derek. What, do you have any thoughts? Well, I, I, just how true that is, I was nodding my head because Ooh. it is so true. It has a whole lot of agenda items. And oftentimes they're not the agenda items that I would care for them to have. <laughs> because, right. they, because they convince me at times that, that it convinced me at times that it's correct. And all it's doing is, is, is bringing up defense mechanisms you know, to block things or to recharacterize things that are issues for me. So it's also engaged in a non-verbal war with uh, parts of the unconscious, um, the archetypes. As ego is an archetype, therefore, it feels that it is the archetype. Although we know the self is the overarching archetype. The ego is a reflection of the self. That's why the ego feels that it is the ultimate archetype and that these other parts of the psyche are intrusive and should not be given the time or um, the stature that the ego has. So it is constantly trying to stand um, up to different parts of the unconscious that have a way of coming up through dreams, through fantasies, um, through active imagination, through meditation, different parts of the unconscious that come about to signal uh, a new way of being or a new way of thinking. The ego does not tolerate that. The ego has a very difficult time with that and it says, I don't need you to tell me what to do. I don't want him to listen to you, or I don't want her to listen to you. <clears throat> now, the ego does this because it feels like it's the righteous owner of consciousness. It is not, but that's how it functions. So there's a lot of antagonism between the ego and other parts of the unconscious. For example, if we want to... Um, um, as teenagers, if we want to show off and show how strong we are, we are forced by our ego into doing certain things that other parts of us are saying, this is a bad idea. Or are you sure you want to do this? Or that doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Things that we might be sorry about later for doing. Things that might end up hurting us. 
So the ego is always there and the ego's job is to stand out. Whether it wants you to stand out or not, it wants to stand out. It has an autonomous idea of what it's supposed to do and can disagree with you. What do you think, Eric? Which part? You had a couple of different points there that I thought was... Any part you want to pick up? Well, I'll go back to the beginning then, because I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And if this is too much of a different sidetrack, just tell me. Uh, you mentioned the, du the dual nature of the ego. Correct. Uh, in regards to the consciousness, to our consciousness. Correct. I also enjoyed thinking about and reading and think and then subsequently thinking about how it has another dual role in that the ego can both and this is something that you don't even have to be a Jungian or in or in or have studied Jungian thought to know this and that is the ego represses content into the unconscious correct however and for a long time, I didn't understand this. The ego can also retrieve content from the unconscious if the if that con if those contents are not blocked by defense mechanisms. Yes. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, it all depends on the 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 ability of the ego to hold uh, itself, not to disintegrate. It's the idea that the ego is independent enough and strong enough to stand on its own, where I don't need to be constantly reinforced by reassurance. Or So when you're growing up and you're a child and you're constantly going to your parents to ask them for reassurance, am I okay? I did this. Is that going to be bad? How is this going to work? So if the ego can stand on its own at a certain point in time in life, then the ability for the ego to go into the unconscious and bring back material, the ego is not threatened. But at the beginning, anything that threatens the stability of the ego, anything that questions its legitimacy, anything that questions its ability to lead is shunned. If not by the ego, by the ego, someone else who's raising you. Oh, no, don't say that, son. Oh, no, don't say that, honey. Oh, no, don't say that, sweetheart. Oh, no, don't say that, my daughter. It's always told not something you should be conscious of or aware of or something you need to dismiss. That becoming conscious of it and integrating it is a problem. And so the ability for the ego to reinforce its boundaries and defenses are compromised if there's an intrusive aspect in that child's life and is always bombarding the ego. So kids who grow up in poverty or kids who grow up in circumstances where their um, physical essence is uh, threatened all the time, or kids who grow up into situations where there is food insecurity, or um, that uh, their shelter is not secure. This takes great weight on the ego to muster up every day a, a conversation to keep you going. Therefore, it doesn't really have the ability to hold itself together unless that ego has been reinforced by other things in the external, or that the reinforcement from the internal is strong enough that the person can say, you know what, this is how they did it. I could do it a different way. But as much as we'd like to say that other people did it differently and we'd like to do it in a different way, we end up doing the same things over again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. 
if what I hear you say, if I hear you saying what you're saying correctly, is this true? Is it true then that in order for the ego to retrieve content from the unconscious that's not blocked by major defense mechanisms, it has to be in, it has to be relatively healthy and, and in right. good working order. Is that correct? Correct. Right. So that means you are not constantly traumatized. That means that you are not bombarded. That means that your ability to secure yourself and your physical security is not, is not in question. Physical security has a lot with the, with the building of the ego. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like going to the gym and lifting weights. If you do it on a conscious um, basis and you do it over and over again, it becomes secondhand. It's not a big deal. And you become stronger and stronger without thinking about it too much. Even, the, usually, pain, even the pain involved, Lahab, doesn't become a big deal. Correct. It, becomes, it becomes much more easily tolerated. Because there is a, there is a, there is a structure um, there is a path and there's a story behind the path that you're taking. And therefore the ego keeps repeating the story. This is our path. This is the path we take. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Now, if that's <clears throat> true about physical pain, is it also true about psychic pain? But yes, because psychic pain attacks the ego in a different way. It attacks its um, presumption of consciousness. We think about every major breakdown that any human being has is when their ego is completely overwhelmed. The breakdown occurs to the human being because the ego can no longer defend against whatever the external psychic event is. And thus the ego is not able to sustain itself. And I find it amazing that, that it has the same parallel both with psyche and or with ego and body because it's consciousness yeah because that's exactly what you're saying is because it's consciousness so it has those parallels because it's consciousness it's consciousness of the body it's consciousness of the psyche it's consciousness of the totality it's consciousness that's reflected from deep within the self the self is in young's terms the ultimate archetype so it is that reflection that keeps pushing forward. And the reason the ego is always reinforced, why it's not a bubble like a balloon that floats out, is because it's directly tied to the self. And so there is an infusion of energy that comes through the self when the ego is in crisis. And that infusion comes in forms of story. You know, my, grand, my grandparents lived through the Depression. My grandfather, my brother fought in this war. My parents grew up on this farm. My brother's uh, mind in this mine. My sisters died on this hill. Wh whatever the story is, that story is reinforced through the self. And therefore, when the ego looked completely overwhelmed and it's about to be conquered, something out of nowhere is like, oh, we didn't know he, he or she had that. This is what people say. I didn't know they had that. I didn't know they were, they, they're able to do that. I didn't know that they were going to muster that energy. I didn't know they could withstand that attack. <clears throat> And what you're talking about is that the ego's reinforcement is coming directly from the self. So Jung, as Jung describes the psyche, there's a network of associations among various contents of consciousness. All of them are linked directly or indirectly to the central agency, the ego. The ego is the center of consciousness, not only geographically, but also dynamically. It is the energy center that moves the contents of consciousness around and ranges them in order of priority. What am I going to do first? How am I going to do it first? 
Who am I going to see first? Who am I going to talk to? The ego needs reinforcement to stay stable. What that means is it needs positive energy. <laughs> oh, it does, doesn't it? Right? It needs, yes. it needs for someone to say, hey, I missed you. Are you okay? Are you doing okay? How are you feeling today? Are you feeling okay? I'm here for you. It needs that, but that support as, as a person, as the ego becomes more defined and stronger, <clears throat> then we move later in life towards the individuation process where it's less about needs of ego because they have been met. And now we are looking for more of a psychological, more psycho-spiritual aspect to our existence. Why are we here? Well, we spent 40, 50 years running after the things everybody said you should run after. Houses, food, cars, money, women, God, whatever it is, jobs, children, having a home, as men, women, opposites, they, they run after security, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But we're all <laughs> running after this once we get through this run. Then it's about what's next? How am I going to make meaning out of this? Why is this important? Now, if you're lucky, the ego has put a foundation in place for you where you could go on to do that, where your physical and psychological and emotional needs are taken care of and therefore you can move into another aspect of your process. If that hasn't happened, then what you have is um, an ego that's strained and overworked and irritated. And I think, um, that 70s show, uh, the ego always calls everybody dumbass. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> so that's, that's an ego. That's an ego and its commentary is about everybody else's ego. And because their egos are not fully formed yet, they're dumbasses. Because they are not conscious of what they're doing as much as they think they are. So, Stein says, the I, in quotations, feels perhaps naively that it has existed forever, even notions of early lifetimes sometimes takes on a feeling of truth and reality. It is an open question whether the I changes essentially in the course of a lifetime. Is not the eye that cried for mother at two the same one that cries for a lost love at 45 or a lost spouse at 80? While many features of the ego clearly do develop and change, particularly with regard to cognition, self-knowledge, psychosocial identity, and competency, one also senses an important continuity at the heart of the ego. Many people have been moved to find the child within. This is nothing less than the recognition that the person I was as a child is the same person I am as an adult. Probably the essential core of the ego does not change over a lifetime. This could also possibly account for the strong intuition and conviction of many people that this core of the ego does not disappear with one's physical death, but either goes to a place of eternal rest, heaven, nirvana, or is reborn another life on the physical plane, reincarnation. So the ego, because of its of its consciousness, its ability to see, understand, and define consciousness, it keeps reinventing itself in different ways. It keeps holding on to certain things. Ah, come on, you need me. What's your life without me? You can't leave me. Remember, we've been through everything together. You know, so it talks to you like it's, uh, it's a partner. Later on, as you age, develop. 
Stein goes on to say we should avoid imposing too much precision on Jung's use of terminology, however, particularly on terms like psyche and unconscious. Otherwise, we will create tight fits where Jung deliberately left gaps and openings. Psyche is not precisely co-extensive with the combined territory, conscious and unconscious, nor is it exactly limited to the range of the ego. At the edges where psyche and soma come together, where psyche and the world meet, there are shadings of the inside outside. That's in quotations. These gray areas Jung called psychoid. This is an area that behaves in a psyche-like way, but is not altogether psychic. It's quasi-psychic. In these gray areas lie psychosomatic puzzles, for example. How do mind and body influence each other? So in the psychoid realm, the psychoid realm <clears throat> also perceives consciousness as well as the sense because what is open in the psychoid realm is the archetypes. The archetypes are the open to the conversation, to the external. Thus, what he is saying in terms of inside, outside, he is saying my external to, my internal to the external, your external to the internal. It is both, I can sense you from the outside and I can sense you from the inside. When you say to somebody, I feel you, um, not just like in a gesture, like you're really connected to this person. I feel you. What you are saying is there is an inside outside connection to you. I know you. I sense what you are sensing. I am where you are. Did not, if I can ask a question, did not Stein say in a later chapter, which we'll get into another day, but did he not somewhat equate that psychoid gray area realm with the spiritual? Did I understand that correctly? Yes, because the spiritual is um, connected to the archetypes. Uh, the spiritual is directly connected to the archetypal dimensions of psyche. The archetypes are the pieces of us that connect us throughout time, connects us to the stars, connects us to the earth, connects us to everything that we think and we are and we are not. So, so yes, the archetypes the, are a part of, this, of the uh, spiritual realm? The archetypes are in the psychoid realm. Okay. They are, they are part of the spiritual realm because in Jung's, uh, in one of Jung's quotes, he says that uh, God is the projection, is the projection of the self by the group. So the collective, when they project out towards the heavens, what they're projecting is the self. And so it is being taken as a grander self. And uh, the projection of the self by the group is the projection of the holy. You look a little lost. Well, um, probably because I need a definition at this point. Um, okay. wh one that uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know that you know that I know that you understand this because we've talked about it in the past. A lot of people that I talk to, I won't say a lot, a number of people that I talk to don't understand the difference between the psyche and the self which we know both are larger than our ego. Well, so if we think of psyche, when you think of psyche, go ahead. When you think of psyche, don't think of as an entity. Th think of psyche as a field. And I think you put it, uh, you put it really well when we talked about it um, a different time, you said, um, it's like waves. You're yes. right. 
It's like waves. So psyche is more like waves. Psyche is ours. It's connected to us, but it's also can be connected to the collective. And thus, when you walk into a certain situation and you say, it doesn't feel right in here. What you're saying is that my field is sensing this field and this field doesn't feel okay. Now, then the ego may take portions of that thought and do something with it, right? Yes, it's going to interpret. It's going right. to say, you don't know what you're talking about. I'll explain right. to you. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because, uh, because, because ego is the center of consciousness. Yeah. Right. This, is, this intuition, what we're calling intuition, or the sense, the sixth sense that comes, um, the ego is saying, yes, people are going to think you're crazy. Don't say those things. Yeah. I, I could tell you, I could tell you what you could say, even though the ego says some of the most outlandish, absurd things in the world. Now you've cleared that up nicely. Now, where does the self come into play with all that? Well, the problem is, is that we get into the self, we kind of move away from the ego because the self is so encompassing of so many different factors. But let's just keep sense that the self, that the ego is a tiny reflection of the self. Yes. Okay, let's keep that in mind. As I pointed out above, Stein says, the ego must be distinguished from the field of consciousness in which it is nested I love this metaphor because now the ego is nested into consciousness like a bird looking out across, seeing what it wants to take in and what it doesn't want to take in, for which it forms the focal point of reference. Everything is related to me, ego says. All of this going on means nothing without me. Or as uh, Eminem says, life is so empty without me. That's one of his uh, lyrics. Huh? Eminem, the rapper? Yes. He says, life is so empty without me. He's, he's singing through ego. Ah, la, 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 la. He's singing through ego. You know, it's like when I, when I come in, when my ego comes in and leaves, your life is empty. My ego gives all of you meaning, <laughs> right? So, uh, good for Eminem. Yeah. So, so what he is he is using he the way he is using the words he's telling the song is telling you about ego. At the same time, he is being uh, clever, but at the same time. He is being um, deceptively clever. He's like, do you know who I am? Yeah. You know, so it says, um, when I said that the ego rests on the total field of consciousness, I did not mean that it consisted of this. This is what Stein says. Were that so, it would be indistinguishable from the field of consciousness as a whole. And we also talked about the field of consciousness as waves. The field of consciousness is constantly coming through. As well as there's a field of the unconscious, there's a field of consciousness. So for example, you're taking a walk, you're in love. You're not conscious except for this beautiful person that you fall in love with. And you're paying all your attention on them and suddenly a bird flies out and your consciousness is taken away. And you start staring at the bird. Is it trying to tell me something? Is it trying to communicate? Your consciousness has been diverted. That's a field. That field always exists when you walk down the street, it exists. So if uh, a protest appeared out of nowhere, you would go, I didn't. I didn't hear anything, you know. This is when they ask people at uh, after shootouts or robberies, what did you see? I, 
you know, there was so much chaos. Mm -hmm. What they're saying is that my consciousness was limited to my own internal process. That's what they mean. There was so much chaos that I was just trying to hold things for me together. <clears throat> so this is uh, this is chapter one. He the, he he talks about ego from a Jungian perspective, which is very different from any other ego. I think Eric, you could talk about this a little bit, but it's very different from Freud's ego. Yes, uh, from uh, self psychology and their understanding of ego. And Adler's view of ego, object relations view of ego. So there are many different understandings of ego and that's why we're kind of pouring over what is ego from a Jungian perspective. In my opinion, um, and of course, before I studied Jung, I studied a number of other of elements of psychology and that you just mentioned, you just named a few of them. And when I started studying the ego from a Jungian perspective, what I found that his writings did for me is that he gave the ego a comprehensive life that many of the other branches of psychology did not do if that makes sense. So the ego is an actual functioning part, I think is what you're saying. Of our of entire psychological process, not a piece. It's not a piece. It's a comprehensive part of our consciousness. So this comprehensive part that uh, Stein says, that you say is comprehensive, that Stein says, nest in the middle of consciousness. Well, I think he's being kind of symbolic here. He's using yeah. it as a metaphor. Because the ego can decide to dip into what needs to be explored and what doesn't need to be explored. Yeah, it's not, it's not like you've got a big circle and in the, you know, you've got a big bullseye and in the middle, that's the ego. Yeah. It, it, the boundaries aren't that, they're not that delineated the bound it's more like may it's more like our it's more like our solar system the sun is at the middle but the heat of that sun spreads out and permeates the entire solar system correct well, well the ego may be the center of our consciousness but it it spread it it spreads out and yes it may it may di be a little bit more diluted the further away from the center it gets, but it extends beyond the center. Yeah. So it would be um, um, what Stein would say, as uh, we will see in the coming chapters, he says, um, the ego is only a small part of a much larger psychological world. Like the earth, he, he compares it to the earth, you compared it to the sun, but compared to a planet. Um, like the earth is a small part of the solar system, learning that the earth revolves around the sun is similar to becoming aware that the ego revolves around a greater psychic entity known as the self. Well, his analogy, after reading, after hearing that, his analogy is better than mine. Yes, but uh, but basically both of you are on the same point. The point is, is that um, there is a center, but everything around the center is very, very different. And the power from the center looks like it's omnipotent, but it's actually all the edges that make this center what it is. Both insights, he says, are disturbing and destabilizing to the person who has put the ego at the center. The freedom of the ego is limited inside the field of consciousness. 
the ego has, as we say, free will in rights. But this, I do not mean anything philosophical, only the well-known psychological fact of free choice, or rather the subjective feeling of freedom. Within its own domain, ego consciousness has an amount of apparent freedom. But what is the extent of this? So, the ego sees itself in like the sun. Although it's a, it's it's more like um, a flare that comes from the center of the sun that could shoot out for thousands of miles into space, H hundreds of thousands of miles. But that somehow is still connected to the essence called the self. This ever expanding idea of something that is connected to everything. And we will get into this because it kind of, I know I opened uh, Pandora's box by saying it's connected to everything. So we will get into that in the coming chapters. Um, Eric, what do you think? Shall we go to the populated interior, the complexes? I don't think we have time for to get into the complexes unless we're just going to say we're going to get into it. Well, let's get let's get into a little bit of the complexes. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, well, can I can I start with this question and and yeah. and, um, and just to continue on with a thought that you just yeah. had about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. About the ego fighting for freedom. Yes. Stein talks about how complexes restrict the ego's freedom. Correct. Now I'm looking at that like I, I view everything on a pie chart and I'm thinking, okay, what restricts the ego from being free? And I'm thinking complexes are a huge part of that pie chart. Ooh. Would that be correct in thinking that? Yes, in a certain way, was if you think of complexes, they are the um, they are the defense mechanisms that are created in layers around the ego, and in the in those complexes are overwhelming forces at times for the ego. The father complex, the father was a very successful man. The child, um, she feels completely intimidated and is never gonna be up to the task of taking her father's company into the future because he was so incredibly brilliant. Now, this is called the complex. This is called the father complex. And she has a personal complex because she doesn't feel she is good enough to take over that position. And therefore, her own personal complex keeps her from moving forward. It holds her back. Uh, why don't you um, start a different wing of the company? The father asks the child or the adult at this point. And the adult goes, no, you run everything great. Everything is perfect. Nothing needs to change. That's the complex. the complex is holding her back. It's not that the relationship with the father is holding her back as much as the complex that <clears throat> is both personal and impersonal. So in the beginning of uh, chapter two, uh, Stein says in reading the unconscious, uh, reaching the unconscious, he says, imagine for a moment that the psyche is three-dimensional object like the solar system. Ego consciousness is the earth, terra firma. It is where we live, at least during our waking hours. The space around the earth is filled with satellites and meteors, some large, some small. This space is what Jung called the unconscious. And the objects that we first come across as we venture out into space are what we call the complexes. The unconscious is populated by complexes. 
This is the territory that Jung explored initially in his career as a psychiatrist. He later called it the personal unconscious. So the personal unconscious for Jung would be the space that is directly in our orbit of the earth. Anything beyond the orbit of the earth would be the collective unconscious. The personal unconscious would be everything that revolves or in close vicinity to the earth. Anything beyond that would be the greater collective. <clears throat> One thing that I loved what he said <clears throat> in, in this chapter, uh, because a lot of people will think, a number of people might think, well, what in the world is a complex? What, what are my complexes? Ooh. And even without having to define it, <laughs> he said that they are the gremlins and inner demons that may catch a person by surprise. Yes. Oh my God. When he said that, I just laughed okay. because that is so true. You don't have to clinically understand what a complex is. All you have to do is think about what is it that grabs you and like a demon or a gremlin and makes you do things and think things that just seem counterproductive, counterintuitive. And it seems like somebody put that thought in your brain. So, and I thought, what a, what a good what a good analogy. I, I, I really like that. So I'm going to read um, from page 39. He said he starts out. He calls it the complexes. Young assumed that what you're talking about, the disturbance of consciousness, which were registered and measured as responses to these verbal stimuli, were due to unconscious associations to words read. Here's his thinking and was congruent with Freud's as expressed in the interpretation of dreams. Where Freud had argued that the dream images could be linked up with thoughts and feelings from previous day or even from previous years. This is a very important point because uh, Jungian dream interpretation is very different from Freudian dream interpretation. Yes, it is, thank, thank goodness including the time all the way back to early childhood. Such associations, however, are extremely obscure and hidden. The associations exist, young reason, not between the stimulus response words, but rather between the stimulus words and hidden unconscious contents. Some stimulus words activate unconscious contents, and these are associated with yet other contents. When stimulated, this network of associated material made out of repressed memories, fantasies, images, thoughts, produce a disturbance in consciousness. The complex indicators are signs of disturbance. So in Jung's idea, when he started the word association, he started talking to people to measure um, the response time. When he would say something like father, and you would go hate him or love him, or savior, or you cross yourself because you're thinking of the great father. Whatever it is, that word is associated and hooked by a complex. And that's why when you think of the word association test or the lie detector test, which came from Young's research. Yes, on this very subject, am I right? Exactly, on this subject. Yeah. The complex is saying, is like, when you hook the complex, there is a galvanic response. There's an emotional response. And therefore, what it measures is the reaction, the emotional reaction to the word. And so, because you've hooked a complex. And so to beat the lie detector test, you have to be able to not be caught by the bear trap that is the complex. 
The complex is always wide open. It always sits there like a cave, sitting there in the story. And there's this, this person who's guarded the cave. This young maiden guarding the cave. It's always an old man, so we'll make it a young maiden. This young maiden guarding the cave. She's standing there. She has, she is telling you, come to the cave. It's a beautiful cave. There's so much in the cave. There's so much treasure. There's so many things you will find out. Come to the cave. What do I need to take into the cave? Nothing. You found the cave. The cave is open to you. The cave is the trap. It's the complex because we don't know what's in the cave. That's why they tell you, don't go into the cave. <laughs> You're going to be caught in the complex. And what's ironic is that you don't even have to go into the cave in order to be affected by the complex. The very fear that you have of going into the cave has the complex has already grabbed you. Exactly. You have already been pulled in. You have and already been lured in. Without even going in. Exactly. She has, she has already taken you inside the cave. You just don't know you're there yet. Mm -hmm. There's uh, in uh, Greek and uh, Greek or Roman mythology, they say, don't pay the ferryman until you get to the other side. So the ferryman in mythology takes you from the land of consciousness to the unconscious. Payment is a conscious aspect of saying, this is where I want to be. So once you give up that aspect, you are no longer where you think you are. That's the trick in the fairy tale. It's always to remember where you are. You always need to be conscious of where you are. So when you go into the forest, there's a path. Follow the path. Don't leave the path. When you leave the path, what you are doing is you are free floating in the world of complex. There are bears in the forest. There are wolves. There are deadly spiders in the forest. There are things in the forest that will hurt you, maim you, kill you. You will never survive the forest. That's why you always stay on the path. So these stories, what Jung called fairy tales and myths, these are stories that we end up with um, um, stories to live by, I think, um, uh, the mythologist said Joseph Campbell myths to live by stories to live by these are stories of psyche these are stories of psychological awareness these are stories of psychological maturity because who goes into the forest old men and women don't go into the forest they go to the edge of the forest young people go into the forest because why? Because they're not afraid. Because the older people have already gone into the forest. And they don't want to go back there. The forest is symbolic of something that you cannot see from the outside. You have to go into to understand what is there. And even from looking from above, all you see is trees. And now we have more sophisticated um, vehicles of seeing things. But symbolically, this is what it was. I find it very interesting, Lahab, that the two people that most illuminate and, and, and bring out in full color thoughts and ideas and feelings that I have about human nature are Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. And 
I thought about it, and, and every couple of years I keep reminding myself, what is it about those two guys? Why do they help me to understand my inner self better than probably anyone else that I read? And, and what connect, what's similar between the two of them? Well, there's one main thing that's similar between the two of them. They both have studied cultures, imagery, symbols from from all over, not only the world in present day, but historically speaking. Ooh. And so they are learning the stories of humankind through history from a broad, pers- from a, and, and very inclusive. Ooh. And isn't it interesting that those two people have hooked in to helping people like myself understand what makes up my my psyche and my mind better than anyone else that I've read? Yeah, so because they go back to our roots, because in all older cultures, in the older themes in all of the cultures that uh, we know of that have existed on this planet, um, some kind of verbal communication or storytelling has been what has um, kept them going yes. and has moved story on to from one generation to the other generation. For a very long time, nobody wrote down the Quran. The Quran was, um, it was memor- memorized. Yes. So to this day, one of the biggest competitions for Muslims in the world is to memorize the entire Quran and recite it. So... The early the, Hebrews did the same thing, by the yes, way. Yes, so, so in all ancient cultures, um, in Islam, in other ancient cultures, the stories were passed on from generation to generation through storytelling. The story kept the psychology of the Hebrews, of the Arabs, of um, different tribes in Africa, um, in China, in Japan, and other places around the world, these stories are what we understand uh, to be the psychology of the people who lived in those lands, who had to survive in those atmospheres, who had to grow around these groups of different people. And a lot of the stories that happened in the Mediterranean those influence huge portions of the world. Those stories are intermixed. Those stories are Roman, Egyptian, Persian, Arab, uh, Mongolian, um, uh, Eastern European, Slavic, uh, Germanic. Uh, there are so many different groups. Carthaginian. Yes, that pushed these stories together. And we started to have these, um, we started to look, contrast and compare to our own stories. As Americans, we have a lot of stories that came from outside of the United States of America that have become part of our story. Yes. One of our stories is that we're a melting pot, that all different cultures come and we interweave, integrate, And so our melting pot is a little cracked right now and dripping, but it does not mean it can't be healed because we were able to create it in the first place. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, for sure. We we created it in the first place. It's the ability of our, the ability of our time is to understand that conflict has always arisen across the world at different times in different places over different things. Conflict in Jungian psychology brings out transformation. Without conflict, there is no transformation. We do not change. We stay the same. We don't change. We change because there's a conflict, because there's energies on two sides that are opposing to each other. Those two energies that come head to head and burn at each other and force each other into positions. Ultimately, those two energies create a third energy, a third way of what Jung calls transformation. 
It's the, it's the irritation between two sides. That's a really yeah. great, that's a really great point to make about conflict because most people view, most people view conflict as a very bad thing instead of an opportunity for tremendous understanding and growth to take place. As a matter of fact, studies of young children who have had all kinds of frustration and conflict and, and, and in other words, all their needs were basically met during their early few years. Guess what happens in their central nervous system? Ooh. They don't develop a frustration tolerance. Ooh. So when they're 16, of course, this is any 16 year old, but it's especially true for those who don't develop frustration tolerance as a result of normal daily conflict Ooh. is they develop this attitude of they go from, you need to sit down in that chair, honey. And they, they go from zero to 10. They don't go from zero to two, then they get into an argument and then they go to four, then they get into more of an argument and they go to six. They go zero to 10 Ooh. because they're, because they've not had any, their central nervous system hasn't had time to develop all the abilities that you need to develop in order to deal with frustration and conflict. Well, yeah, I mean, our nervous system is, uh, I mean, even our immune system is built on, um, is built on conflict. Our immune system is built on attacking that which attacks us. Anything that comes within us that we cannot. So these are ancient ways of dealing with the other. And when a virus or a bacteria or something hits us, if we cannot kill it, we try to assimilate it. So ultimately, the transformational aspect of assimilation, assimilation is of transformation. Yes. The irritation between the anxiety of not knowing and the idea that something needs to be known in that irritation that forces a conversation outside the bounds that usual conversation occurs is what forces something to change. If we always do the same thing and talk in the same way and don't believe anything can change, then we are stuck in what, what is called the old ways. We are stuck without psychological transformation. So if somebody in the old days looked at you, it's like, oh, they're stuck in the old days. They're ancient, as von Franz likes to talk about, those who are holding on to um, using tools from the 18 and 1700s because they're doing it the right way and we're doing it the wrong way. Yeah, n n n to live a life of nirvana just isn't, even if it was possible, it wouldn't be good for us. I, I, remember, I remember an episode of the original Star Trek where these flowers were throwing out this pollen and everybody sniffing it became in a state of nirvana and Spock was hanging from a tree and he fell in love with, I don't remember her name, Charles Bronson's wife. And Kirk found the whole, his whole ship, all his shipmates were down there and they had turned into Nirvana people. Ooh. And of course, you know, Gene Roddenberry used him to give the little speech at the end and his speech at the end, after he made Spock fight him and he got him so angry because that's the only thing that could knock you out of your state of Nirvana. He goes, why did you take me out of this? And he said, because we're not made this way. We have to have, so we have to have goals. We have to have struggle. We have to have conflict. We have to have something to fight through in order to realize our full potential. Yeah. So, so that what Jung would say is that Nirvana was a, it was a complex. It was, complex, it was a complex of eternity. It's a complex of heaven. It's the complex of that. We don't need to do anything. Everything will come to us and we will always eternally be happy. So that is the complex. So 
as we go on in the chapter, it talks about the populated interior. And the populated interior is part of the unconscious. Um, and so he uses a term here, I thought I'd discuss a little bit just because it's not used in a lot of other psychology. So the term constellation appears frequently in Jung's writings. This is really important because understanding what constella uh, constellation is for Jung is an important one in Jungian lexicon is a word that often mystifies readers at first. Usually it refers to the creation of a psychologically charged moment a moment when consciousness either already is or is about to become disturbed by a complex. So what happened between um, Spock and uh, Kirk was that there were two complexes fighting it out. <laughs> which usually happens between Spock and Kirk. Roddenberry's pretty smart, isn't he? He's very, very smart. This term simply expresses, he says, refers to the creation of a psychologically charged moment, a moment when consciousness is either already is or is about to become disturbed by a complex. This term simply expresses the fact that the outward situation releases a psychic process in which certain contents gather together and prepare for action. When we say that a person is consolidated, we mean that he has taken up a position from which he can be expected to react in quite definite way. Complex restrictions are quite predictable once one knows what the specific complexes of an individual are. We refer to the complex latent areas of the psyche colloquially as buttons, as in she knows how to press my buttons. When you press such a button, you get an emotional reaction. In other words, you consolidate a complex. After you have known a person for a while and you know where some of their buttons are, either avoid these tender areas or go out of your way to touch them. So we have this ego that sits in the middle that observes everything and tells you how and what you are seeing and what you're talking about, what you're thinking and where is it. Then we have these other things that are connected to words that are connected to feelings that are connected to thoughts that are connected to maybe touch that we call buttons that we react to. These are the complexes. And this is where the ego becomes, um, gets in trouble because it is overtaken by the complex. And you, you start to talk to the person you say, I know you're upset right now. But, you know, he's a kid. He didn't mean to call you that. I know, I know, I know. I'll get over it. I'll get over it. Because what we call the feeling tone complex is controlling you now, is controlling your emotional output. Remember when we talked about um, the galvanic skin response? So we've hit a button. And... The galvanic skin response test or the lie detector test works on touching buttons through the personal complex. Do you lie? Do you tell the truth? Do you love your mother? Do you love your country? These are all complexes. And interestingly enough, some of the people who are best at beating the lie detector test are people who have learned to dramatically control and suppress their emotions, like or, sociopaths. Or, or disassociate from the complexes. Yes. So in another way, what they do is then instead of suppressing the complex, 
what they do is like, well, I'm not here. I don't know who they're talking to. Maybe they're talking to um, a person I met in 1920 or a person I met in 2020. I don't know who they're talking to. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I don't lie. Yeah, okay, what else? So part of it is to, uh, and, and the way they teach you to beat these lie detector tests is to disassociate. They're literally teaching you how to disassociate so you don't get hooked by the response. But there is even a tell when you disassociate. Because if you have no reactions to the questions, then there's a lie scale. There's a scale that says this person is a really good liar because they've answered all the questions without a single irritation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was never a point where, you know, it got to the point where they struggled. What are they comparing you to? They're comparing you to um, everybody else. They're comparing you to the regular population. Everybody struggles with certain questions because we have personal complexes as well as collective complexes. We have personal complexes. That's why uh, a lot of these uh, lie detector tests, they ask you personal questions. Before they ask you broad questions, they ask you personal questions to see if you're gonna lie. And then that's how they catch you. They use those to measure your responses to the other questions. So in, um, on, chap in, on page 46, um, Stein says there's levels of the unconscious. Usually one considers complexes to be personal. And it's true that most complexes are generated in a person's own specific life history and belong strictly to the individual. So if you're an orphan, you have a complex. If you grow up without parents, you have a complex. If you grow up with one parent, you have a complex. Uh, if you grow up with grandparents and your parents, you have complexes. It depends what type of the personal complexes are. It depends how they split off. But there are also family and social complexes. Such complexes belong no more to the individual than a disease belongs to an individual. It belongs to the collective and the individual catches it. This means that in society, many people are similarly wired. Psychologically speaking, people who grow up in the same families or extended kinship groups or traditional cultures share a great deal of common unconscious structures. stories and myths that we live by. Our family did this, our family climbed this mountain, our family had this much money, our family was um, saved the country, our family, our family, our family was, our family was nothing, our family was terrible, my family, what, whatever the story is, it has its own group dynamic. And thus, a lot of kids who grow up in um, difficult situations um, have very conflictual dynamics. And when um, part of the reason they try to get away from their siblings is because of those conflictual dynamics yeah. to keep themselves safe because they know they could be dragged into that type of thinking and they don't want to be there. They don't want to be controlled by that complex. I'm really glad he brought this up because it's so easy for us to think that it really doesn't make that much of a difference who we are surrounded by and who we interact with. And yet it does. Makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference because we end up being who we are from those interactions a lot of those personal interactions give us a sense of meaning in our own existence 
or a lack thereof, whichever, it still has meaning. The lack of meaning gives us meaning in that it didn't give us anything. So when you say it's like, well, you know, I got a lot out of my family and the other person says I got shit out of my family. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You are both saying the same thing. Yeah. You're both saying I have meaning into what they gave me, whether you thought it was shit or nothing or something great. You both have those meetings, meanings associated, consolidated. They both, they both possess aspects of the complexes of those other people that they shared. Yes. He, he goes on to say, he goes on to say, and this is a very important point. He says, nearly every child begins school at the age of five or six experiences the same stress of tests and trauma of failures and humiliations, then goes through the anxiety of applying to college for further education or to business for jobs. All of these common experiences at the hands of similar disposed persons and authority create socially based psychological patterns through a kind of subtle programming of the personal unconscious. So for those who don't think school affects you, it does. Shared traumas make for shared complexes. Mm -hmm. Very good. So if we think of uh, Sandy Hook, we think of a shared complex. That shooting created a shared experience, a shared terror, a shared idea that we're not really safe, even though when we think we are at our safest, we're not. That's why self-help groups have it. they're, They're good. Don't get me wrong. They're terrific. They help a lot of people. But it's easy for some people that go to those types of groups to become stuck because they're focusing on these shared complexes and it helps them to develop an attitude, unconscious attitude of I feel safe as long as I'm surrounded by these complexes. Yeah, so I keep repeating the same story. Yeah. I feel safe because everybody else repeats the same story. I'm going to repeat the same story. So therefore, there is no friction. There is no no, uh, irritation with the consciousness. There is no transformation. You basically go, it's like going back to your family structure at Thanksgiving or at Christmas and finding yourself hating everybody there. You, because basically what's happened is you are moved in to your unconscious processes and you're just intaking everything, all the craziness you're interacting with. Now, even if you try to change that and go in there with a conscious perspective of what's going on, unfortunately, because of all these connections you have to these people and because you have shared complexes, you will also be activated. Yes. It doesn't matter. You will still be activated. Somebody will say something that will activate you. And somebody will push your button. Because you have a shared complex. And again, and again, I say again, that those groups can be very good and very powerful. But to to make sure to help ensure that what we're talking about doesn't happen, always have someone else that's helping you that's outside of that group. So Stein says that we can think here of cultural layers of the unconscious. Sorry, Eric, did you want to say? I was just going to say in addition to the group. Yes. Sorry. That's That's where I wanted to go next. So we can think here of cultural layers of unconscious, a sort of cultural unconscious. It is personal in the sense that is acquired in the individual lifetime, but is collected because it's shared with the group. The unconscious at the level is a structured by a larger cultural pattern and attitudes. These end up influencing the individual's conscious attitudes and the more unique complexes within a nexus of unconscious cultural assumptions. We are the land of the free, the home of the brave. That's a shared complex. The cultural unconscious 
is different from the collective unconscious, which I will discuss in chapter four. So he, he distinguishes between the cultural unconscious and the collective unconscious. We're not talking about the collective unconscious. We're talking about our cultural unconscious. We're talking about the personal unconscious and the cultural, the personal in our families, the cultural in within our groups. He says, this raises the interesting question of how complexes are formed. The usual answer is by trauma. But this must be put in a wider social context. Some of Young's studies in word association looked at the question of family influences on the formation of unconscious contents in children. Through the word association experiment, he found strong evidence of strikingly similar patterns of complex formation among family members between mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, and mothers and sons, for example. Of these combinations, the closest were mothers and daughters. Their responses to the stimulus words revered nearly identical anxieties and conflicts. From this, Young concluded that the unconscious is importantly patterned by close relationship in the family environment. Exactly how this takes place is not clear from his work. It is by the some sort of transmission. It is by repetition of similar traumas passed along through the generation. And then he says, I know this is not an answer. So, Traumas create the personal complexes because the complexes are a defense against things that happen to us. They have evolved with us. They are archetypes. So, There's more content here that I would love to go into, but I think we will save this for next week. And we will do um, the second half of chapter two, psychic images. Um, and psychic energy, which is chapter three. So we will do the second half of chapter two and chapter three for next week. I hope you will join us for Young's Map of the Soul by Dr. Marie Stein. Um, my name is Dr. Lahab El Samurai. I am part of the uh, Institute for Conflicts uh, and I am part of the Individuation Podcast. Um, my partner here um, for many years and uh, more recently, uh, Dr. Eric Tomlinson, uh, we've been working together for a couple of decades um, in uh, old Chi-Town. And now we are back on Zoom, uh, reconnecting and working together um, many years later. So I look forward to having Dr. Tomlinson with us. We also usually get a couple of... Uh, people who jump in sometimes when they're not busy, but it's uh, me and Dr. Tomlinson. We have been on a, a tour of psych psychological insight into the world of Dr. Carl Jung by using Dr. Uh, Marie Stein as our guide. Um, Dr. Lahab El Samurai, and I bid you farewell. Eric, would you like to bid our listeners farewell? Uh, my best to all of you and please be safe. Uh, thank you. And we will be back next week for another um, Institute for Conflicts Individuation Podcast.